Please welcome Dr. N.T. Wright. Thank you very much for your welcome and your enthusiasm. It's very good to be here with you today. And uh, always when a Brit comes to America, there are cultural differences which you have to navigate. And uh, I begin with a story about one of those, which was about 10 years ago. I found myself in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was at a conference and I was jet lagged, so I was awake very early in the morning. And there was something special happening in another part of the world. And at 6 a.m. your time, I phoned my daughter at home because I knew that she would be glued to the television because England were playing Australia in the final of the Rugby World Cup, which only happens every few years. And uh, England always try and do well, but they never won it before. And it was in Australia, so it was against the host nation. And this was the big game. And I knew my daughter would be glued to the tele television, and sure enough, I phoned when the game was over, and she was thrilled because up to the last minute, England and Australia had been 17 points each, neck and neck, and then in the very last minute, the poster boy of English rugby, Johnny Wilkinson, had dropped a goal, and England won the World Cup. And this was just the most amazing, and if you'd been following the, 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 the tournament thus far as I had, you would have been as thrilled as I was. And so I came off the phone, and there I was in the half darkness, 6 a.m., um, and I was in the, the lobby of this hotel in Atlanta, and I wanted to run up to the clerks behind the desk and hug them and say, England just beat Australia at rugby at the World Cup. And I looked at them and I thought, they're not going to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and then I, I looked at other people around, you know, I wanted to say, have you heard the great news? And I realized it wasn't great news to them. And then I waited and the conference gradually woke up and people started coming down and I thought, sooner or later I'm going to meet somebody who knows what, what this is all about. And the first person I met was an Australian. <laughs> and I realized that it is possible for good news to be complete foolishness to Americans and scandalous to Australians, but for those of us who believed, it kept us happy all week you will pick up the resonance I detect from Paul's letter in 1 Corinthians. And there's something funny about news, and the Christian gospel is supposed to be good news, but for years we have lived in a culture where we've assumed that everyone knew what the bad news was and was waiting for the good news. Uh, that everyone sort of knew they were sinful and we just needed to remind them that actually God loved them and would forgive them and so on, and that was the good news. Well, that is good news, put like that, but today, in our culture, most people are not walking about thinking, oh dear, I'm a sinner, am I going to hell? Well, maybe in parts of American culture they still are, but believe me, the rest of the Western world really isn't. I've given up that long since, and many, many parts of your great culture as well have long since given up walking around, scratching their heads about saying, how do I get to heaven, and here's the, here might be the good news. We are back in the normal world once more, the world of Jesus and Paul, the world of the early Christian centuries, where people were not going around waiting for good news about somebody called Jesus who had come to save them from, from their sins. I often think about Paul going into Philippi or Thessalonica or Corinth or one of those great cities and he comes with good news and it was like me in the hotel lobby in Atlanta good news we have a new lord a new lord that's dangerous talk because the word lord in their world referred to one person in particular and it was Caesar the, em the Roman emperor well who is this new lord what on earth are you talking about well he's a Jew from Palestine a Jew in the ancient world very bad news. Most people were a bit suspicious about it. Oh, and, and they crucified him. Well, now this is completely absurd. This is crazy. Crucifixion is the most devastatingly shameful and awful thing to happen to anyone. How could such a person be anything other than a cause of a curse and a hissing and so on? Oh, but God raised him from the dead. And now they are really wondering whether Paul has been drinking too much something or other or smoking something or whatever. Because, because you know... <laughs> Everybody in the ancient world, like everybody in the modern world, knows that dead people don't get raised. People sometimes today think that, oh, well, they were primitives back then. They didn't know the laws of nature. You bet they knew the laws of nature. They know perfectly well that when you bury somebody, they don't come back. They're not stupid. You know, as as C.S. Lewis said, um, 
the reason Joseph was, Mary, was worried about Mary's pregnancy was not because he didn't know where babies came from, but because he did. And <laughs> we, 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 are back in the, we are back in the plural world where people hear a message about Jesus crucified and risen, and they say, this is just completely crazy. And some people are offended by it. In a pluralistic world, many people are offended by it. What are you saying? We, we, we like our life the way it is. Who do you think you are to come at us with this uh, extraordinary talk? And one of the most extraordinary things I find as I look at the Christian history of the first century with Paul particularly going around his world, but then the second and third centuries as well, when the Roman authorities were doing their best to stamp this nonsense out because they saw that it was causing havoc in communities and, and leading people to abandon the old gods that they used to worship and possibly leading them to be socially and politically and culturally subversive as well, and they were, all of that was true. So why did people become Christians in the early church? Well, that's a very interesting question. It wasn't because great theologians thought out great ideas and passed them on to other great brains who crunched them a bit differently and wrote long, incomprehensible books. You know, that, that, that stuff goes on. I've contributed to it as well. The reason why people became Christians, despite the fact that in their plural world this was nonsense and scandalous, was because they saw something happening in real people's lives and in real communities, and they thought to themselves, didn't know you could live like that, didn't know that was an option, didn't know that you could actually care for people who are not your kith and kin, that you could look after the poor, that you could go and take care of the sick, that you could do all those things that the early church did without really anybody telling them to except that they were worshipping the God we know in Jesus and they found that they were compelled to go and love people and found communities that were doing that stuff, risky though it was. I'll come back to that in a moment. But you see, we, we live in a world which many Christians find quite scary because we were used, and many of you will have grown up in homes which were used, to thinking in terms of a basic Christian worldview and living in a more or less Christian civilization. I grew up in Britain in the 50s and 60s and uh, assuming, because my parents took us to church every week, that this was actually how most of the world was. And I gradually discovered at school and at college that actually most of my world wasn't like that and I had to learn to navigate. It. But one of the great things that's happened now is that the word God itself is back on the agenda. It used to be the case that when you said the word God, everybody in my culture and probably yours thought of an old man up in the sky who might have made some rules and was looking down and being a bit anxious about what we were getting up to. But if we said the right prayer or did the right stuff, then he would be nice to us and we might end up living with him after all or something like that. Um, Christian Smith, a sociologist from Notre Dame, has said that the default position to this day of many young people in America is what he calls moral therapeutic deism. That is, a God who's a long way away, a deist God, a distant God, but uh, he actually has given us some rules, and if we work it right, he may look after us and help us to find a way where our lives won't be too bad. That's not very like mainstream Christianity, by the way. But the point is this, People are more and more saying, wait a minute, does the word God refer to a being like that? When I was a college chaplain in Oxford many years ago, many students would come to me and say, uh, you won't be seeing much of me because I don't believe in God. And I would say, which God is it you don't believe in? Which would puzzle them, and they would describe vaguely this old man up in the sky making rules and so on. I said, I don't believe in that God either. And you could see this look cross their minds. Uh, the chaplain is an atheist. What's this about? Um, <laughs> And I would say, no, I believe in the God that I see revealed in Jesus of Nazareth. And if you're interested in exploring who that God is, and he's very different from the one you just described, then maybe I will see you. And some of them I did, and many of them I didn't, and that's how it was. But that there is a chance in our culture for Christians to grab the opportunity and actually not only say, but show who this God is. Because so often our lives as Christian communities have been a bit like that deist God, a bit detached from the rest of the world, not really engaged with it, a bit sort of snooty, a bit looking down our noses, oh dear, we wish people didn't behave like that. Instead, when we really grasp who the living God is in Jesus of Nazareth, then we discover that this God is a God of generous love. He's the creator. He's the outgoing God. He's the God who made a world so lavishly that it's full of beauty and power and strange 
glory and so on. And though it's gone horribly astray, he, his generous love was enough to come in person, in the person of his son, and give and give and give his life. And when communities and individuals do that stuff, then it makes sense to talk about a God who is not the old bully in the sky, but the God of generous, outgoing, overflowing love. The God who Jesus pictured in that wonderful parable which we call the prodigal son, but actually it's the parable of the running father because in that culture, senior figures don't run and yet when the prodigal son is coming a long way off, the father girds up his, his, his cloak and so on around him and he runs down the road. He loses his dignity in order to go and embrace this son. When God's people behave like that with and to the people who are on the edge, with the people who have forgotten and have been forgotten by the rest of the world, then people take notice. So when Paul was going around doing all this stuff, of course, he had sometimes to address the actual questions. There's that famous scene in Athens when they put him up in the highest court of the land because they weren't sure what he was talking about and they were a bit suspicious about it. And though what we have in Acts chapter 17 is just a summary of what he said on that occasion, because it only takes two minutes, and believe me, knowing what we know about Paul, Paul was a man who could literally preach people to death. You know, people fell out of windows and um, <clears throat> that sort of thing. Um, when they put him up in Athens, he wouldn't just take two minutes. Oh no, he's going for the big time. Um, but what he does is he nails the different philosophies which are out there in his... It's all about God. Is God a long way away? No, he's not far from any of us. Is God then just the sum total of all the forces within the world? No, he's the God who made all those things. You can see Paul navigating his way around the question, who is God? And at the end, he comes back to it and he says, this God has fixed a day on which he's finally going to sort the whole world out through the man whom he's appointed, whom he raised from the dead. And at that point, of course, they snigger, they burst out laughing. Oh dear, we know this man's... And yet some people say, my goodness, we'll hear you again about this. Something about that message finds people, does things to people, goes down into people like a hot drink on a cold day and makes them think, oh my goodness, it may be crazy, but I think I'm starting to believe it. And their lives get changed. And one of the great things, again, about our contemporary world is that though there is so much pluralism and so much I do my thing, you do your thing, yet more and more people, and your generation particularly, are aware that the world is out of joint and we have a passion for justice to see it put right. And one of the tragedies is people so often assume that the God of Christianity isn't concerned about those things. And then we go back and we read the Old Testament and indeed the New, and we see, of course, God is the creator who longs to put the world right. And in the Psalms we read about the whole earth and creation and the sea and the mountains singing for joy because God is coming to set everything right, to judge the world, not in the sense of smashing it to smithereens, but in the sense of putting it right at last. We can share that passion, but the rest of the world doesn't always know how justice, how putting right works. We know, or we ought to, because we know it in Jesus. That's what the letter to the Romans is all about. That's what Paul was talking about, that we believe in a God who cares so passionately about putting the world right that he has come to take the full force of its shame and pain on himself and then in his resurrection, extraordinarily, to launch his new creation, which is a world of joy and justice, a world in which God's kingdom comes, as we pray, on earth as in heaven, in strange ways that leave us breathless sometimes. And so when we look at the plural challenge of our culture with many questions about God, that's good. We can get in there and explore with people who this God is. Only we don't just do it with words and ideas, we do it with lives and with prayer and with love and with generosity and with what some of you have been doing, mission trips and service trips and so on. And so the same thing with Western culture. People often say, oh, well, Western culture appears to be so smug and self-serving. And yeah, it often looks like that, particularly from the outside. 
but it's also got great energy and great potential, and as you will know in a great institution like this, great possibilities for good. And somehow we have to navigate all the good things which are there and make sure that in, in embracing those, we do so in a way which is about generosity, which is about service, which is about justice, which is about helping those less fortunate than ourselves. Because you see, at its heart, the Christian message is not a theory. The Christian message is not advice. The Christian message is news. That word was good news, evangelion, gospel. That's what it's all about. And so many bits of our culture want to turn it back into good advice. Here's a lifestyle you might like to adopt if it suits you. Here's a way you might learn to pray if you like that sort of thing. No, that's not what it's about. You know, the, the word is good news, and in Paul's world, that word was often used when a new Roman emperor came to the throne or when they were celebrating his birthday. And the heralds did not go into a town like Philippi or Corinth and say, Tiberius has now become emperor. Therefore, if you feel like having some imperial kind of experience, you might feel like giving allegiance to him. No, they didn't say that. Believe me. They said, Tiberius is in charge now, so you do what you're told and you pay your taxes. And if you don't, we have ways of encouraging you. Now, of course, <laughs> the, the way the world does power, this is one of the radical things about the gospel, is totally different from the way God does power. The way God does power is what we see in Jesus, where he says the Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many. But the good news is about God's power. It is foolishness to the Greeks, scandalous to the Jews, but for us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And the power of God is not just for us, but my friends, it is also through us, out into the world. It is good news about something that did happen. We must never lose that. The, the, the postmodernists, like the modernists, want us to stop talking about Jesus, want us to stop talking about the thing that actually happened in real time in the real world. They want us to talk about, oh, here's a religious experience you might have. Here's how you maybe would like to live your life or whatever. And we have to go on saying, no, something happened in history. When Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead, the world was called to account and God's new world was born. And we are living by the Spirit out of the energy of that. But it's also good news about something that will happen when God will make new heavens and new earth and bring together the, the scattered and divided and shattered bits of his lovely creation in a way that we can only glimpse at the moment, but we see it most fully, of course, in Jesus himself. And the challenge then for us, your vocational challenge, today and in the rest of your lives, and I'm aware that most of you have got all your lives before you. What a wonderful thought of opportunity. The challenge then is to live between the news that happened then, the news that will happen at the end, and for us to be the good news in the present. So that people, as they did in the second and third centuries, living in that radically plural world of the ancient Mediterranean world, the Roman Empire, will see there is a different way to be human. And it's the way that happens when people are worshipping the God we see in Jesus and celebrating the fact that he has brought his justice to the world, that he will bring his justice to the world. And through our acts of generosity and kindness, both individual and corporate, people can see the good news of who this God really is. My prayer for you is for wisdom in your vocation for where your gifts will fit. There are a thousand different things that God is wanting to do in the world, and he will have for each one of you particular tasks which your gifts and your training and your talents will suit you for. But this is how it works. We live between the news of what did happen and the news of what will happen, and we are called to be the good news here and now. Thank you. God bless you.